To be holy means to be separate. And in a culture that expects us to affirm everything, uh, we must remember that God calls us to be holy, to be separate. Today's passage is a reminder that God will go to great lengths to secure our holiness. God is very concerned about the Christian's holiness. God will even allow major conflict to secure our holiness. And if you've ever been in this relational conflict, uh, it causes major grief, major pain. You know, I've sat in prayer meetings here on Tuesday nights, and I've seen the tears flow and flow and flow over broken relationships and families, over unsaved friends, over, over prodigal family members, over relational conflict. It's incredibly painful. Maybe you're in that place this morning. But as painful as it is, it's also inevitable, isn't it? Uh, I've heard it said that in life, you're either entering a conflict, in a conflict, or coming out of a conflict. So it's a part of our lives. It's something we have to learn to deal with. And the good news is, the gospel teaches us that God can use it for his glory and our good. And that's what we're talking about this morning. We're looking at the relational conflicts we face and we're seeing what God wants to do with that. So if you're taking notes, there's bulletins on your seats with fill in the blanks. Here's the take home message this morning God uses our grief to grow our holiness. God uses our grief to grow our holiness. In 2 Corinthians, seven, uh, we reach a very interesting situation between Paul and the Corinthian church. Now, imagine this. Paul and the Corinthian church are in conflict with each other. Can you imagine that? If you've been with us for a while, uh, there's a lot of issues at Corinth. And what is happening in this situation is that the Corinthian Christians were caught in sin. And at this point, Paul is not in Corinth. He's actually outside of Corinth. And he hears of this sin, and he writes them what scholars know as the severe letter, okay? He writes them this letter to address their sin, and he sends it by the hands of a man named Titus. How would you like to be Titus in that situation, right? There's this conflict between Paul and the Corinthians, and Paul writes a, a severe letter, says, hey, Titus, bring this over to the Corinthians, uh, and so Titus is stuck in the middle. You know, he has no choice. So he takes the letter and he brings it to the Corinthian church. And then Paul waits. And he waits. And he waits. And Titus doesn't come back. You know, this isn't 2022. Titus couldn't just shoot a text to Paul and say, hey, they received it well. I'm okay. No. Paul doesn't know what's happened. And he's tied up in knots about this situation. And Paul was actually doing ministry in a city called Troas. Uh, he says that God had even opened a door for him in Troas. But he's in such anguish over this that he leaves Troas and he goes to Macedonia to find Titus because he wants to know how the Corinthians responded to this discipline and he also wants to make sure that Titus is safe. And so this is the relational conflict between Paul and the Corinthian church and if you find yourself in relational conflict this morning, uh, this is going to be encouraging for us. But it's also hopefully going to give you some wisdom on how to approach a situation like that because these situations are inevitable for us as Christians. So let's look at verses 8 through 11. I'm going to read them for us and then we will dive right into the text. Paul says to the Corinthian church, uh, starting in verse 8, for even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. 
whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So this is the outcome of this very broken situation. And if we find ourselves in a broken situation of relational conflict this morning, this should encourage us and should show us the way forward. Uh, There's going to be three things uh, that come out of this situation for Paul and the Corinthians. They all have to do with godly grief and they all have to do with holiness. And here's the first one. Godly grief produces holiness through remorse. Godly grief produces holiness through remorse. Look back at verse 8. Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, even if I made you grieve uh, with my letter, that's that severe letter, he says, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. I find that phrase really interesting. Paul, are you, you know, struggling with this? You don't regret it, but you did regret it? I mean, Paul, aren't you uh, walking with the Holy Spirit? How could you have any doubts about this situation? Well, Paul was a human being. And Paul, it says when he wrote this severe letter, it says back in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 4, that he wrote it with anguish of heart, affliction, and many tears. It's called the letter of tears. And that's why he says, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. Because he wrote it, and then he's waiting for Titus, and then he starts to say, maybe I shouldn't have said those things. What if I push them away? Isn't that how it feels to confront sin? And Paul wrote this letter with tears because Paul felt the severity of the disciplinary letter along with the Corinthians because he loved them. And listen, if you're ever called to confront a wayward child, a wayward sibling, a wayward friend, a wayward pastor and you love them, you will feel that pain because you love them. But that love is a good thing because it checks us from being too harsh, right? And that is what Paul is experiencing in this situation. And that's why he says, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. You know, I think of the parent uh, who disciplines their child and then they walk into another room and break down and say, I came down too hard on him. I think of the Christian friend who confronts another Christian that they love and they walk away and they break down and they say, I think I ruined the relationship. Did I do the right thing? I think of the pastor who sits down with a church member in sin and leaves and says, I hope they know how much I love them. I mean, we've all experienced this, haven't we? And you can be godly and you can be doing the right thing, but you will feel this tension. You will feel this remorse because these situations, they're painful, even if you're doing the right thing. But you you gotta hear the other side of this. The other side of this is that Paul still confronted the sin. Did you get that? Paul still confronted the sin because For Paul with the Corinthians, he loved them too much to not confront their sin. Listen, it is not biblical love to never confront sin. You know, there might be a way to do it, and there might be a time to do it, and we might need to pray for the right way to do it. But there is a time to confront sin, even if it causes pain in the relationship. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, not blessed are the peacekeepers. You get the difference? Jesus brought a kingdom of peace. Jesus brought us life in peace. But Jesus confronted sin. Jesus confronted sin. Jesus was a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper. A peacemaker lives in the peace of God, but they're willing to confront even when it causes tension. A peacekeeper avoids conflict at all costs. 
They choose comfort over conviction, comfort over confrontation. And I'm afraid when I study a passage like this, that today in the church, we're replacing peacemaking with peacekeeping. That in our lives, in our families, among our friends, we mistake peacekeeping for peacemaking. I wonder how much ground has the church given up by being peacekeepers rather than peacemakers. We choose comfort over confrontation and we do this in the name of love, but that's not biblical love. That's our culture more than it's the Bible. We are called to be peacemakers, not peacekeepers. And God will never ask you to affirm something that he doesn't affirm to reach someone for Christ. God will never ask you to violate his word to preserve a relationship for Christ. But man, it's easy to get that wrong, isn't it? I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I know I got some people pleasers in here because I myself struggle with people pleasing. And it's a flaw. I don't think it's a good thing. But I want to be liked sometimes more than I want to be holy. I want to be liked so often more then I want to point someone toward Christ, even if it causes tension in the relationship. I struggle with that tension. But God has convicted my heart this week to be a peacemaker and not a peacekeeper. I'm afraid that when we become peacekeepers rather than peacemakers, we lose our saltiness as Christians. Jesus said salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Listen, Christians, we got to keep our saltiness. This world needs our saltiness. Now be praying and be asking the Lord for the right way to confront these things. There's a time and a place, and it always needs to be in gentleness and love, but we got to do it. We got to stand up for what's right. Now, just as those words leave my mouth, and I feel a bit of tension in here over the hardship of that, I just want to say this too. These conflicts and confrontations, uh, when they are really Christ-centered, uh, they cause significant remorse, don't they? I mean, it's painful for the person doing the confronting. It's painful for the person receiving the confronting. It's painful all around. But just because it's painful doesn't mean you're doing the wrong thing. You know, some of you might be in the situation this morning uh, where you're in Paul's shoes. Maybe you're a parent and you have a wayward child. And you're saying, I, I love them. But I love them too much to not confront this. And maybe when you reach out to that child, you receive a lot of vitriol back. Or maybe it's that situation for you with a friend or in the church, and you get blasted over it. Well, let me encourage you this morning. Let me encourage you not with my words, but with Jesus' words. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You remember the prophets? Israel would be in sin, and these guys would come along. Sometimes they felt a bit crazy. <laughs> They're from outside the establishment, and they come, and they say, listen, listen, guys, don't you remember God's word? Don't you remember what God said? And they would get blasted for that. They would receive a lot of vitriol for that. They would even be killed for that. And that's why Jesus says, Blessed are you when others revile you. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they did to the prophets. I just want to encourage you this morning that if you are standing up for the truth, gently, lovingly, and faithfully, and you're receiving persecution for that, stand firm. God sees, God knows. Let's be, peace, let's be peacemakers, not peacekeepers. Godly grief produces holiness through remorse. But the story gets a little more uh, cheerful here, so don't get down. Here's the next one. Godly grief produces holiness through 
repentance. Holiness through repentance. Look at verse 9. Paul says, as it is, I rejoice. Wow, that's good news. He was in remorse. Now he's rejoicing. What's happened? Not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So in that first point, I wanted to address the person who's confronting. Now I want to address the person uh, being confronted. And man, I've been on both sides of this, okay? Just so you know. And Paul makes this distinction between godly grief and worldly grief. What Paul is saying is there can be the same tears, the same pain, the same sorrow. But actually, they might be different kinds of grief. What's the difference between godly grief and worldly grief? One word, right there in the text, repentance. Repentance, that's the difference. Repentance means literally a change of mind. It means to stop going one way and start going another way. And godly grief, uh, the remorse is followed by repentance, a changed heart, a changed mind that leads to godliness. Worldly grief ends with the remorse that leads to an end in death. Worldly grief is grieving the worldly consequences of our sin. Worldly grief is grieving uh, the, the fallout, the tears, the broken relationships, the broken health. It's grieving the consequences of our sin, but it ends there and it leads to death. Whereas godly grief is grieving who you've sinned against, God. That's godly grief. It's vertical. It's not horizontal. You understand that the root problem is that your sin is against a holy and righteous God. And that type of grief leads to real and true repentance. You know, Jesus said uh, to the people of his generation, Jesus said to them, he said, Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. And and they weren't repenting at Jesus' preaching. So when Jesus says that someone repented, it means they really repented, right? Nineveh is lifted up as this paradigm of true biblical repentance. So I figured if we're talking about repentance, we should probably go look at what Nineveh did. So Nineveh was an ancient city in Assyria, and there was this prophet named Jonah. If you've read the story, he didn't get it right all the time. And Jonah very reluctantly went to Nineveh and he walked through this this great city and he cried out to Nineveh. He said, listen, in in the next 40 days, if you don't repent, God's going to destroy this whole city. Okay, that's a pretty serious message. And so this reaches the king of Nineveh and you'll see Jonah chapter 3 verses 6 through 10 up on the screen. Uh, The king of Nineveh here has a choice between worldly grief and godly grief. Let's see how he responds. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published it through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Now think about this. Think of the entire city of Chicago suddenly proclaimed a fast over their sin. I mean, that would be crazy, right? I'm not holding my breath on that. But imagine that that happened, and not just that. Imagine that they didn't let any of the animals in Chicago eat or drink either. I mean, that's what this king said. He said, we're not going to eat. Our cattle aren't going to eat. I mean, this is like extreme repentance, right? And when you see true repentance, it's powerful, isn't it? When you experience true repentance in your heart, it's powerful. A person is totally changed. 
And this is such an awesome response in verse 10. Uh, This is what God says. He says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he'd said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Man, what if our country got on our faces and repented? Would God respond to that? He would respond, wouldn't he? What if our churches got on our faces and repented? Would God respond to that? He would respond to that. Let me bring it home for us. What if we got on our faces when we get it wrong and repent? Does God respond to that? He does respond. Because a broken and contrite heart, God will not despise I want to encourage you this morning, if there is sin in your life that God is pressing you on, when you get on your face, admit you got it wrong, and put yourself in the hands of a gracious and loving God, he will respond with grace and he will change you because a broken and contrite heart, he does not despise. And the Corinthians did that. Praise God. The Corinthians might have sinned a lot, they repented too. And Paul is rejoicing now because this has made all the conflict worth it, hasn't it? If Paul had not uh, confronted them, they would have never repented. But he does, and it causes pain, but they repent. And it brings about their holiness. And may that be our prayer and our hope when we're in these situations of relational conflict. Godly grief produces holiness through repentance. Here's the last one. Godly grief produces holiness through righteousness. Look at the righteousness of the Corinthians' repentance here as Paul keeps going. He says, For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. You see, before Paul confronted the Corinthians on their sin, it's likely that they were apathetic, indifferent, careless about their sin, unwilling to deal with it or confront it, but then Paul confronts it and something changes in them. That apathy is replaced with eagerness. They're doing everything they can to make it right. And when Paul says they've proved themselves innocent in the matter, What Paul likely means here is that now the Corinthians had grieved over their sin, dealt with it, changed, and been cleared by God of the matter. And this is really important for us. We have to hold on first to the tension of the gospel, that we in and of ourselves are not righteous, but are declared righteous by the righteousness of Christ, right? And we're never going to get it right. But on the other hand, just like the Corinthians had made that profession, Uh, just the problem with living sacrifices is we have a tendency to crawl off the altar. The Corinthians had crawled off the altar, right? They had sinned. And while they were still saved, uh, God was calling them back to greater holiness. And God does this in our lives. And so when he does that, uh, we need to respond just like they did. But when Paul says uh, that they had proved themselves innocent in the matter, I think we need to ask the question, Who did they prove themselves innocent to? Was it Paul? Yes, but I think it was more than that. Was it the Corinthian culture, the corrupt culture around them? Yes. They had cleared their testimony before them, but it was more than that. Godly grief is about God. They had proved themselves innocent in the sight of God. Their hearts, their eyes were toward God. God. When we think about repentance, it is about who we are repentant to. And that's the difference between godly grief and worldly grief. I think about uh, David, King David. King David got it wrong a lot. But King David was a royal repenter, wasn't he? And in Psalm 51, which is the psalm on repentance, David had slept with another man's wife. David had put that man to death. David had caused his child to be put to death because of his sin. David had done something where God said the sword would never leave his family. I mean, 
You want to talk about fallout. David experienced that. So David makes a staggering comment in this psalm where he says, against you only, God, have I sinned. What? David, what about that man you killed? What about your son who died? What about the turmoil and strife in your family? Are you saying that you didn't do that? Well, yes, he did that. But David understood that the root of his problem was his sin against the holy, just, and righteous God. And isn't that what repentance is about? Isn't it about getting right with God and letting him pick up the pieces? And as long as we're living in this world where we are just concerned about the worldly consequences, we're not really repenting. You know, as I prepared this sermon, I thought to myself, this isn't just some notes I'm reading to you guys today. I've experienced this in my life. Some of you know a little bit about my story. I got saved at a very young age And I had a a real strong faith through my young years. But toward the end of college and into my early adult life, I stopped walking with the Lord. And at that time in my life, uh, by the time I looked up, I was really far from God. And I had developed sinful habits in my life that I didn't know how to stop doing. And I remember having all the things of worldly grief I hurt my parents, I hurt my family, I hurt my friends, I hurt my health, and that caused me grief. But it was worldly grief. It was dealing with the consequences, not dealing with my convictions. But I remember when all of that changed for me. Uh, One night, I came home, uh, back to my apartment, and God had put on my heart Uh, to watch this movie that I'd heard about called The Passion of the Christ. I look back, I have no idea why I would want to watch that movie at that time in my life. But God put that on my heart. And if you've seen that movie, it's pretty graphic, and I don't do well with blood, so you can imagine what it was like for me to watch that movie alone. But I made myself watch it. And I kept my eyes open as I watched it. And God started stirring in my heart. And I remember falling on my face and realizing for the first time that I had sinned against a holy, just, and righteous God. My next thought was, what do I do about that? And I felt condemnation because I realized that I uh, deserved eternal death in hell. And I couldn't make that right. And I cried out to God. And I said in my heart to God, God, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. And God changed my life. And those sinful habits that had caused that season of destruction in my life, God has totally delivered me from those things. Praise God. And God brought peace into my life. He opened up his word to me. He changed my life. But listen, I had to get serious about the fact that I had sinned against a holy God. And maybe you're in that place this morning. Maybe there's sin in your life that you haven't addressed before God. I just want to remind you that just like what he did for me, a broken and contrite heart, he will not despise. Turn to him. Be met with grace. He'll clean up the mess. Or maybe you're the person uh, who's Paul in this situation and you're confronting the sin and you're being met with persecution. I want to encourage you again. Stay the course. Lean on God. Blessed are you for great is your reward in heaven. Band, you can come up. Or maybe you're the person this morning who has never given your life to Christ You are trying to do it on your own and you're seeing over and over again that that doesn't work. Well, I want to encourage you this morning, do not leave this place until you have made that relationship right with God. Go to him with all your brokenness and he is able to pick up the pieces and make you right with him. I'm going to be over in the prayer room as we close in worship if any of you need prayer this morning.